Well, good morning and a very warm welcome to you all and this service of worship from St Andrew's Lecky. In three weeks from now, we aim to be in the church building with a limited uh, number of people worshipping together and the rest joining in online as we stream the service across our, from our, to our website and our YouTube channel. And uh, we look forward to that new beginning. And this morning we mark another new beginning. We're moving into a new series thinking about being a disciple. It's part of a very purposeful season of discipleship that we're having over these next few months. And integral to that is actually coming together, albeit by Zoom at the moment, on uh, Monday evening or starting uh, tomorrow evening when we think about this whole theme of being disciples of Jesus. Being his disciples and growing as his disciples really happens in life together with God's people. So what we're doing on Monday nights is, is an essential part of all of this. So I want to urge you, if you haven't already, uh, to sign up for that. Just go to the website, click on discipleship, and then you just fill in your name and an email address and we'll send you out a Zoom link. We look forward to seeing all that God will do among us in growing our relationship with Jesus and with one another in the coming months. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, as I shared last week, uh, Joyce Caldwell, one of our loved members, passed away. And uh, Joyce just had the most radiant, wonderful faith in Jesus. And, and one of the gifts that God gave to Joyce was a ministry of prayer and of praise. That the Lord would often inspire her with songs or with poems by his spirit. Uh, they were such a blessing to others because they revealed God's heart to us. And I want to begin our prayers this morning by using uh, the words that, uh, of a prayer or a hymn of praise that Joyce penned for us. It's called My Lord. So let's pray together in these words. You are my Lord who slept upon a pillow. You are my Lord who stilled a stormy sea. And you hear still the cry of anxious sailors, however tossed or hard pressed they may be. You are my Lord, who thirsted for cool water. Beside a well you asked her for a drink, and you felt our human need for water. With living water quenches now soul thirst. You are my Lord who struggled in a garden, who wanted your prayers answered as you willed. Yet when your father gave a different answer, accepted Calvary as that better thing. My human Lord, who for the joy before you despised the shame and did your father's will, give me the faith to follow you completely when in wise love you ask the different thing. Father God, we worship you. Lord Jesus, we praise you as our Lord. And we pray this day you would meet us in your mercy and in your grace, and that we would hear and respond to your call to be your disciples putting your will above our own and receiving from you all the glories and the gifts of your kingdom, of your forgiveness and of your eternal life. Let's join our voices together now in the prayer the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, we sing now our opening praise, urging us to draw near to the cross of Jesus Christ, our Lord. everybody I wonder if you've ever said the words it's not fair now if you've got a brother or sister I bet you have said it's not fair because our mums and dads no matter how hard they try to be fair things don't always work out like that here's a picture of me and my sister and when we were little we argued a lot we were always getting into fights and squabbling over things 
if we had a treat like a cake or something like that, my mum would say, right, one of you needs to cut it in half and then the other person can choose and that will make it fair. I think that was a really good way of going about it. But we used to also get matching coats and presents and matching bags and sometimes that was okay and sometimes it was a bit annoying that she had the same thing as me. In today's Bible story, the children are going to be learning about Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau were so different. They looked different, they liked different things, and they had completely different personalities. And in fact, their mum and dad didn't treat them fairly at all. They were very unfair to Jacob and to Esau. I think that sometimes if we don't read our Bible very much, we forget and we think that the Bible is full of good people who always did the right thing. But that's not true at all. There's lots and lots of examples of people getting it completely wrong, of doing things that are not fair, of doing things like lying or murdering or stealing. And yet God still works in their lives. God still had a plan and a purpose for them. And God still wanted them to spread his love. God still wanted them to try to do the right thing. And God still wanted to love them and to care for them. And I think that's amazing because I get things wrong all the time. We all do. We all get things wrong. But God still has a plan for us. He still has a purpose for our lives and he doesn't give up on us no matter what. Isn't that amazing? Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much for your love. That doesn't change even though we change, even though we do things wrong, you still love us. Help us to try to do the right thing and help us to stay close to you and to spread your love instead of getting cross with each other. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me. Go with me, I still will fall. Go with me, I still will fall. Go with me, I still will fall. Go turning back, no turning back. Go with me, I still will fall. Go with me, I still will fall. Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Will you decide now to follow Jesus? Go turning back. Turning back. Okay, well, our young people are having their meetings outside today, hopefully in the glorious sunshine. And our children, however, are meeting online, and you can go and go and log into your online groups just now. I hope that you're blessed. And we continue to remember to bring our offering to God as part of our worship of him, committing that to him in Jesus' name and for his glory. And uh, just a reminder again, if you missed the first part of the service, we're starting this new, very purposeful season of discipleship today and tomorrow evening we're coming together uh, to meet over Zoom to explore this theme further. Uh, to share together, to grow as disciples of the Lord. So if you haven't yet signed up for that, please go to the website, click on it and uh, just fill in your name and email address and we'll send you out a Zoom link for tomorrow evening. But for now, Andrew and Julie Knox are going to lead us both in our prayers and in the reading of God's word for this morning. Let us pray. 
Lord, thank you for your word to us this morning. May we hear it this morning coming to us in your power and authority. Come follow me has been your invitation throughout the generations. Help us, Lord, to hear that call again afresh with a renewed enthusiasm and an undivided heart. Gracious, loving God, all authority you gave to your Son. Jesus, in turn, gives that same authority to all who would follow him. I will make you fishers of men. Father, sometimes we feel that we can't be we can't answer that call, but Lord, thank you, Jesus, that your grace is enough to enable us to do so. And Father, as your body, we want your concerns to be our concerns. Jesus, make known to each of us how and where we can be your disciples. Equip us and enable us as individuals and as a church in this work. We give thanks and we pray for the continued freedoms we enjoy in this land, where we are free to proclaim the word of God. May we never become complacent with that privilege. Continue to bless the word preached Sunday by Sunday, not only here in Peebles, but wherever men and women of faith speak of Jesus and the power of the Saviour's blood to save. Lord, your word cannot be bound. Father, we also pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for the same faith that we ourselves profess. Lord, strengthen and encourage them as they seek to obey and answer your call to follow me on a daily basis. As they faithfully look to witness to the love of God in Christ in continually challenging situations. Yet in spite of persecution, many are coming to faith in lands where the ruling authorities have tried to eradicate all trace of your body. Lord, your word cannot be bound. Father, faith comes by hearing. So continue to bless Open Doors and the United Bible Societies as they faithfully take the Bible into countries and to people who are desperate for hope. In particular, bless the work of the Bible Society in Mozambique, a country where literacy rates are low, but they have a strong oral, to the oral tradition. So these solar-powered devices that bring your word to them are bringing healing and encouragement to the church in that land. Lord, your word cannot be bound. Father, your concern is for our wholeness in spirit, body and mind. And we pray for all who feel under attack spiritually this morning especially those who would seek to minister in your name. And we claim the promise in our reading, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Lord, all the authority you have given to Jesus you now make available to us, for we are co-heirs with Christ. Lord, may it be that we experience and know the authority to reject and repel the attacks of the devil. And we proclaim in the name of Jesus that we are his. The devil has no claim on us, that it is by the blood of Jesus we have been redeemed and set free. Hear us as we pray for those known to us who are ill at the moment. Bring them comfort and healing. We also pray for those who have been bereaved. Comfort them in their time of mourning. Continue to bless and guide the team involved in Soul Restore. We pray that practitioner and client alike would know and experience the touch of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have called Sarah to youth work in Peebles. We pray for continued blessing for Hart and Matt, particularly in these strange times. May they know your peace and provision. Bless Sarah as she seeks to honour you in all that she does with our young people. Equip her as she disciples them and builds them up in faith. Lord, as we transition back to face-to-face -to -face worship, continue to bless the different ministries in our church that have blessed us over this past year. Thank you for the gifts of all involved in bringing us together virtually on a Sunday. Lord, your word cannot be bound. Father, you continue to bless us in new ways every day. This last year has taught us that. So we would ask that you would shape us into the kind of disciples who would bring fresh blessing on a daily basis into our immediate spheres of influence in our homes, 
our workplaces, our neighbourhoods. Bless us and encourage us in these intentional steps of faith. And lead us where we need to be led. Provide for us out of your glorious riches. And protect us and sustain us in all these situations, knowing with increasing confidence your love and mercy for us. Lord, we bring you our prayers this morning. In the name of Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Matthew chapter 4, verses 17 to 25. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Our second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. May God bless to us this reading of his holy word.
Well, a few weeks ago, I talked about how we've been given an opportunity at the moment as a church to to reboot, to think about how we will rebuild as things open up more and more in the months to come. It's an opportunity because a lot of our normal activity has had to stop. And that gives us a chance to ask, well, do we continue with the same things or do we do things differently and in thinking about this I I, want to pull us back actually to some core things I've been sharing with our elders and ministry leaders teams uh, three core values if you like that I think are important I believe are are given by God for us to to focus on three things that I want to do everything in my power to ensure are central to all that we do. And so if there's anything that we're doing that doesn't have these things as central to them, then we need to be asking serious questions about whether we're doing them right or whether we should be doing them at all. And the first thing is this, the first core value, if you like, is is the presence of God more than anything else. I want to encourage us to be a people who seek after the presence of God, who follow where he is calling us and and who seek him above all things. Second core value that I I want to make sure is enshrined, if you like, in all we do is, is building the people of God, building us up as a people, a, a particular people that God wants us to be. And that's where this whole theme of discipleship is right at the forefront this morning. So we'll pick up more on that this morning. And thirdly, and finally, I I want to ensure that we focus as a core value on the healing ministry of Jesus. That's not to say that's more a more important aspect than many of his other aspects of ministry, but to say that I believe that God has called us in a very particular way to bringing the healing presence of Jesus to our community in a way that proclaims the kingdom of God and Jesus as King. Let's pause just now to pray, to invite the presence of the Holy Spirit as we introduce our new theme of our sermon series this morning of being disciples of Jesus. Father God, help us to be a people of your presence, a people of power, a people who love one another with the love of Jesus. And a people who respond to your call to minister to this community and we pray as you anointed your first disciples to heal the sick we do pray that in proclaiming Jesus that you would give us 
and extend that particular ministry of bringing healing to a hurting and broken world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we read this morning very well-known words from the end of Matthew's Gospel. They're the final words that we have recorded of the, the risen Lord Jesus in Matthew's Gospel uh, addressed to his disciples and to us by extension. We often refer to these words as, as the Great Commission. Great because of its importance. This is the commission of Jesus to his people. Go and make disciples. Go to all peoples, all nations and make of them disciples. Make of them disciples who in turn will make disciples of me, the King and the risen Lord Jesus. It's important just to, to know what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say go and bring people to church uh, that will Go and bring people to sit in church for an hour on a, a, a Sunday morning. He doesn't even say, go and make members of the church. He says, go and make disciples. Interestingly, in all of the Gospels, he doesn't tell us to build the church. He says in Matthew's Gospel, I will build the church. What he says to us is, go and make disciples disciples of all people. Well, what is a, a disciple? Well, the disciples of Jesus who first heard this word from him, this great commission, their only model for what a disciple of Jesus is was their, their own experience. That They had been discipled by Jesus for the last three years. For three years of their lives, Jesus had lived with them. He had shared his life with them. That, that meant he'd, he'd been in their homes. He had journeyed with them everywhere. He'd literally lived in, well, not literally, metaphorically, he'd lived in their po pockets and he had lived in their pockets. They ate together. They, they talked together. Jesus taught them and he cared for them. He came among them remarkably, though he is the Son of God, remarkably he came among them as a servant. He served them. He loved them till the end. And now the other side of the cross, the disciples have seen the full extent of that love that Jesus has for them. He would laid down his life for them. They'd known him in his uh, ministry across these three years, continually forgive them. But now they saw the, the full cost of that forgiveness of God in Christ. And they knew now the full power and authority of their Lord that they were following as he'd been raised from the dead, conquering the power of death. And what's evident from looking at these three years that the disciples spent with Jesus is that Jesus was doing something akin to what we would describe as mentoring. He, he, he took them along with him and showed them himself at work. He, he proclaimed the good news of king, the kingdom of God over and over. The disciples would have heard him proclaim to crowds, listen, repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is near. And, and then he gave them a taste of that kingdom as he healed the sick as he drove out demons, as he showed the love and the forgiveness of, of God the Father, as he challenged that which was unjust and that which was wrong. And not only did the disciples stand at the edge as observers, Jesus made them participants. He gave them something to do. He sent them out to do the very things that he had been doing, to speak his proclamation of the kingdom. He sent them out even receiving his power and authority to do those mighty works of healing the sick, of destroying the works of the devil, of confronting that which was wrong with the truth of God. This is what they understood to be disciples of Jesus, people who had spent time with him, who were being shaped by him. 
The word disciple literally means learner or student. But, but we associate these words learner and student often with a classroom environment where we're, we're reading books, where we're trying to cram in lots of information. Of course, that's important. Information is important. The teaching of, of Jesus is important. But, uh, but actually, a, a better word to think about discipleship is being an apprentice of Jesus, because this isn't just about the accumulation of information. This is about the transformation of a life. There's a writer, uh, Juan Carlos Ortiz, I'd probably uh, pronounce that completely wrong. Any Spanish speakers could correct me, but it was an Argentinian, um, and, uh, a minister who wrote a book called Disciple in the 70s that created quite a stir because he was so straight talking. And, and he says this, a disciple is a person who learns to live the life a teacher lives and gradually teach others to live the life that he lives. So he's a disciple learning to live the life of his teacher and gradually he starts discipling others, teaching them to, to live that same life. Ortiz goes on, so discipleship is not a communication of knowledge or information, it's the communication of life. This is what it is to be a disciple of Jesus. It's to have your life shaped by his. And the way that that happens is in direct relationship with him, personal relationship with him, just as those first disciples shared their life with him and he with them. So we grow as disciples through a personal relationship with Jesus. This is really important. The living presence of Jesus is everything to us as God's people. Without a personal relationship to the living Lord Jesus, without personal discipleship of him, there is no Christianity. There is no church. D David Watson, the writer and, and, and minister uh, who, who died some years ago, he brings this out by talking about the gospel accounts of what happens between the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Just observe what goes on with the disciples. It's very evident that to them, Christianity is dead and buried without Jesus alive. There is no Christianity. What you see there between the cross, after the cross, before the resurrection, is just utter despondency. It is over. The movement Jesus began to their mind no longer exists. There's no sense of, well, well it's very sad that he's died. We're going to grieve his death. But do you know what? He's left us with this great legacy now that we're going to continue. He's left us with this amazing teaching that we're going to transform the world with. No, there's no sense of that. Jesus is dead and buried, so, so the movement is over. It's finished until he rises again. This is, couldn't be more different from what we find with Buddhism. And what happened after the death of Buddha? Buddha is one of the people who would come very high to the top of anyone's lists of the most influential human beings that have ever lived. But do you know what happened when he died? His disciples were asked, well, well, how do we remember him? Do you know what they said? Well, it's not about him. It's not about Buddha. It's not about remembering him. What matters is his teaching. It's his teaching that we'll live by. It's his teaching that we will enshrine and, and, and build our lives upon. Jesus' teaching is absolutely vital to us. He says it here that you, you command them to, you teach them everything that I've commanded you. And from, from day one as minister, I've emphasised just how vital this is. The Bible, the, the word of God, we build our lives upon it. it. It's an integral part, an essential part of what it is to, to live as a disciple of Jesus. 
But being a disciple of Jesus is all about a living relationship with him. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we listen to the word of God so that we live as disciples of the living Lord Jesus who promises us here, I will be with you always. That's why Christianity be began, became a religion because Jesus is alive, because those first disciples recognised it's not finished at the cross. He's risen and he's alive and he continues to be with them always, albeit now in a different way, no longer bodily with them, but with them by his spirit, with them in the presence of his church, which he calls the body of Christ. Being a disciple of Jesus is being a follower of him. And secondly and finally, just as we draw to a close, in following the Lord Jesus as his disciples, we are following him as the Lord. That's why I just gave him that title, the Lord Jesus. We're following him as the one who says all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. We're following the one who said to his disciples, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. You see, the call to being a disciple of Jesus isn't just an invitation, it is an invitation that, 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 that God allows us the freedom to respond to, to say yay or nay to. But it's more than an invitation, it is the command of the King of Kings. And at the, the end of the day, we will either reject that command of the one who has the highest authority in heaven and earth, or we will gladly obey it. We'll either gladly and willingly be his disciples, followers of the King, submitted to him in all ways, or at the last, we will be shown to be, his, to be rebels against his reign. And I wouldn't want to be in anyone's shoes when at the last the king of glory who died to give his life for the life of this world returns. I, I wouldn't want to be in anyone's shoes that dies as a rebel of the king of kings. He is the, the king of kings and he calls us to be his followers and to be his followers means bringing every aspect of our lives under his authority as Lord. It means bringing our relationships and how we conduct our relationships under the authority of Jesus. He gets the say in all our relationships. He gets the final say, the first word on how we conduct our relationships, on who we have relationships with. He, he is the Lord. He, he has the first word and the final say on how we use what we have in our bank accounts. He has authority over his followers' decisions about our lives, about what career that we do, about how we use our free time or our so-called free time. I say so-called free time because actually as followers of Jesus, we become his servants. You know, read the New Testament, see how, observe how disciples of Jesus identify themselves. I, I'm Paul. I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. I'm Peter. I'm a servant of Christ Jesus. The Greek word there is doulos. It's the same word that's used for slave. It means one who has given up their authority to the authority of another in all aspects of their lives. It means one who is given over to the master's will, the master's preferences. You know, I find it helpful to think about the manse you know, in relation to thinking about the, the rest of my life and thinking about how all of my life comes ultimately under the authority of Jesus. Because the manse is something that has been given to us, actually given to us by the church, given by you 
to to bless and provide for the minister and the family and his or her family and, and and because of that because you've given the manse to us you know we uh, rejoice in it as our home we built up as our home it's very much ours we have a, a great sense of it's it's belonging to us but do you know what if I tomorrow morning knock through some walls in the manse and and made it into made it fit to be a bed and breakfast then started running it as a bed and breakfast on the side there would be more than a few eyebrows raised in fact i would be in in serious pro trouble you you'd have every right to chuck me out of the manse at that point because i, I simply don't have authority to do that this manse is ultimately for the the ministry of the church it's not just for my purposes or for my plans and it's the very same with every aspect of our lives everything that we has jesus graciously gives to us but he but he wants us to know that it ultimately belongs to him ultimately it's all for the king and for the king's business to be a disciple of jesus is is to sign every aspect of our lives over to him our our time our money our ambitions that the way we live our lives it's all given over to him in his grace he's a good lord you know he wants the very best for us he's the good shepherd who wants to lead us beside still waters and, and to green pastures so, so he wants to be good and to be kind he wants to provide for us in in every way he, he, he wants us to know that that everything he entrusts back to us is is ultimately his at any point he can say you know what i i want you to give this back now or, or I want to use this, I want you to offer this now in service of me in this particular way. That's the kind of servant mindset that we need to get into our heads as disciples of Jesus. If we don't have that, then we actually have to go back to the beginning and ask, actually, have we heard the call of Jesus Christ? Have we truly responded to him as Lord and said, yes, I am your disciple? You know, I'm purposely challenging you this morning. If you're listening, thinking, you know, I, 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 I want this, but I, I, I don't know that I'm able. Then, then be encouraged by this last scene in Matthew's Gospel. They, they worshipped Jesus. These are the disciples who'd spent three years of their life with him who would be used to turn the world upside down for him they worshipped him but but some doubted these weren't superheroes they weren't perfect people they, they were very human jesus knew their every weakness and he knows your every weakness what, what he looks for is the submission of your heart to him to come before him worshipping even if you're doubting to give your yes to him trusting that as you follow the the lord of glory he will equip those that he calls and that he is no man or woman's debtor let's close in prayer Father God, help us as a church in this season to meet you in new and wonderful ways. Deepen our fellowship with Jesus and with one another. Help us to hear the radical nature of the call of Christ and to respond to it. Make us a people of power. Send us out in your power, in your authority to do your mighty works and sculpt us to be a people who love each other with the same quality of love that you have loved us with help us to forgive one another as in christ you have forgiven us help us to bless one another as in christ you have blessed us and help us to offer our very lives as a living sacrifice to you holy and pleasing 
and help us to know the intimacy the nearness of the presence of Jesus we promise is I will be with you always it is in Jesus name that we pray and for his glory amen well let's close by praying by singing that God would build his kingdom here
Well, may you know the presence of the Lord Jesus, who promises to be with you always. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you both now and forevermore. Amen.